Hello, this is Mr. Fields, and this is my video on hormones and diabetes. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you've watched the previous one on non-communicable disease, because that will help you to understand this one better. Now, in this video, we are going to look at hormones and endocrine glands and what those things all mean. Then we'll look at the effects of insulin and glucagon. Then diabetes. Um, thyroxine and how we control the metabolic rate and adrenaline and the fight or flight response. Let's start first of all by looking at what we mean by hormones and getting in place a lot of the, a lot of the language that will help us with the rest of this video. So to start with a hormone is a chemical messenger that affects how part of the body works. So one example of that is the hormone insulin which we'll look at in more detail later in the video. And its job is to help control the concentration of glucose in our blood. Now, hormones are released by endocrine glands. So an endocrine gland is an organ that produces hormones and then releases them into the bloodstream. So for example, our hormone insulin is produced by a gland called the pancreas. Next, we have the idea of a target organ. A target organ is the part of the body that is affected by a particular hormone and different hormones will have different target organs. So continuing with our insulin example, the target organs of insulin are the liver and muscles. That means that they are the organs that are affected by the insulin. And lastly, we're going to talk about the idea of homeostasis. This is about maintaining constant internal conditions inside the body and it's super important there are lots of different conditions in the body that need to be kept constant or at least within a narrow range for example temperature uh, blood glucose water content your metabolic rate and many many more things besides that now hormones play a major role in homeostasis so let's meet some of the different hormones that, that we'll be talking about so let's meet some of our important endocrine glands. Now, if we start at the top of the body, the first one we'll meet is an organ in the brain called the hypothalamus. Now, the hypothalamus um, produces quite a wide range of different hormones, including one called TRH that we'll look at towards the end of the video. Now, moving down very slightly, just beneath the brain, um, hanging off the bottom of it, is an organ or a gland rather called the pituitary gland. Now, the pituitary gland is often known as the master gland because it produces so many different hormones. But one of the ones that is relevant to us later in, in the video is a hormone called TSH. Next, moving a little bit further down, now we're around the throat, we've got the thyroid gland. Now, this is a gland that produces another hormone called thyroxine that we will also be looking at later in the video. Moving on down, next we uh, sort of just below our liver, uh, around our digestive system, we have the pancreas. Now the pancreas produces lots of different substances, but relevant to this video, it, it produces two hormones, insulin and glucagon, which are both involved in controlling our blood glucose concentration. Next, if you've ever had that, that sort of rush of excitement uh, when, you're, when you're in a dangerous situation, that is due to the effect of adrenaline, which is a hormone produced by the adrenal glands, which sit just on top of each of our two kidneys. Next, if you are female, you will have probably, hopefully, um, ovaries. Now, ovaries produce the female sexual hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And if you are male, you will have, hopefully, testes. Now, testes produce the male sexual hormone, testosterone. So that is some of our important endocrine glands. What we'll do now for the rest of the video is look at a few of those hormones in a bit of detail and see specifically what they're doing to control the conditions inside our bodies. Okay, so the first hormone we're going to look at in detail is insulin. And the role of insulin is to reduce the concentration of glucose in our blood. Glucose just being a type of sugar. So sometimes you might hear about blood sugar concentration, sometimes blood glucose concentration. They mean the same thing. Now, the, the gland that releases insulin is called the pancreas. And the target organs, so the organs affected by it, are the liver and muscles. And here's how it works. So after we eat a meal, the blood glucose concentration rises. And we can see that in this diagram here, each of these blue spots is supposed to represent a molecule of glucose. And it goes up because our meal contains lots of glucose and we digest the meal and it all gets absorbed into the blood. 
Now, if that glucose concentration were to stay high, it can cause all sorts of damage to our cells. And so we've got to find a way of reducing it. And that's where insulin comes in. So the insulin is released by the pancreas when it detects that we've got that high blood glucose concentration. And what it does is it tells the liver and the muscles to take glucose in from the blood and convert it into an insoluble stored form called glycogen. And you can see that glycogen here. So this, that sort of blue thing is supposed to represent a glycogen molecule made by joining lots of individual glucose molecules together into what we call a polymer. Now that has the effect of reducing the blood glucose concentration back towards a safe level. Now, if you are doing higher tier, you need to be aware of a second hormone that affects blood glucose concentration, which we call glucagon. Now, the role of glucagon is the exact opposite of insulin. It is there to increase the blood glucose concentration. It's also released by the pancreas, and its target organs are also the liver and the muscles. So how does it work? Well, let's remind ourselves that with insulin, its job, when the blood glucose concentration is high, the pancreas releases insulin, and causes the liver and muscles to convert that blood glucose into the stored form called glycogen here. Well, between meals, we find that our blood glucose concentration drops. And the reason for that is because we're using the blood glucose concentration for respiration in order to release the energy that we need to, to go about our lives. And that uses up that glucose that was in the blood. So at that point, the pancreas releases glucagon. And what glucagon does is it tells the liver and the muscles to take this glycogen here and break it back down into the individual sugar molecules that it was made from in the first place. Uh, and that then uh, causes the blood glucose concentration to increase again. And we can see that on this graph. So this graph shows how the blood glucose concentration changes over time, you know, throughout a typical day. Now, just note on this graph that we've got an ideal range where we want the uh, blood glucose to be uh, between those two grey lines. Now, if we start here, you can see that after a meal, the blood glucose concentration starts to rise and we get this big spike in blood glucose. And it would be really dangerous if the blood glucose concentration stayed that high. And so at this point, the pancreas releases insulin and that has the effect of lowering the blood glucose concentration back down into the safe range here. But as time goes on, we start to use up more and more of the blood glucose by respiration, and you can see the level drops below the optimal range. So at this point, the pancreas detects this, and it releases glucagon, and that has the effect of bringing the blood glucose up again, back into the safe range. But then maybe we have another meal, and the blood glucose rises to another spike, and so we'd release more insulin. And you can see how this process just goes on and on throughout the day, with insulin being released after meals to reduce our blood glucose concentration, and glucagon being released between meals to bring it back up again. Okay, so let's look now at the idea of diabetes. Now, diabetes is when we have an inability to sufficiently reduce the blood glucose concentration after a meal. Now this is a non-communicable disease. That means it, it is a disease, um, but it can't be spread from person to person. There are two types of diabetes. The first one is type one diabetes. Now this is caused when the pancreas stops producing insulin. And this can happen because for reasons we don't really understand, the immune system will sometimes just go a bit mad and kill the cells in the pancreas that produce that insulin. So with none of those cells, the pancreas can't make insulin. So the treatment for this then is just to inject insulin in carefully measured doses after each meal to bring the blood glucose back down. Now, sometimes it's done directly by a syringe like this. Some people will have themselves attached to a, an insulin pump that would do this automatically for them after meals. The second kind of diabetes is called type 2 diabetes. Now, the cause of this is that the body stops responding to insulin. Um, with type 2 diabetes, we talk about something called insulin resistance. So the body is making the insulin, it's just 
it doesn't respond to it. It's resistant to the insulin. Now, there are risk factors for this. For example, having high BMI, high body mass index, um, obesity, um, essentially, um, having a poor diet and a lack of exercise. That doesn't mean that if you meet any of those conditions, you will definitely get type 2 diabetes. It just makes it more likely that you will develop it. Now, the treatments for this are varied. You can take medication to sensitize the body to insulin. You can improve your diet and you can increase the amount of exercise you do. And it is actually possible to cure yourself of type 2 diabetes. In fact, my husband's, uh, so my, my cousin's husband did exactly this. Um, he had type 2 diabetes. He went on a very, very strict diet for about six months. And by the end of it, his blood glucose um, had returned to normal. He um, was able to respond properly to insulin and he no longer has type 2 diabetes. And so long as he continues to maintain a healthy lifestyle, it's likely that the type 2 diabetes won't return. Next, we're going to look at controlling metabolic rate. Now, this is a higher tier topic, so ignore this if you're just doing foundation tier. Now, your metabolic rate is the rate at which the body consumes oxygen and the products of food to release energy. So essentially, this is how quickly your body is burning energy. Now, to control the metabolic rate, we have quite a complicated process that works like this. The first thing is that the hypothalamus releases a hormone called TRH. Those initials stand for something. You don't need to worry what they stand for. Just call it TRH. So remember the hypothalamus up here in the brain, and it's releasing this hormone called TRH. The next thing is that the TRH stimulates the pituitary gland to release TSH. Again, just the initials is absolutely fine. So we can see the pituitary gland down here, and it's releasing TSH. The TSH stimulates the thyroid to release thyroxine. Now, thyroxine is the actual hormone that will directly control the metabolic rate. So we've got our thyroid gland here around our windpipe, um, and um, it's releasing the thyroxine. The thyroxine then increases the metabolic rate. So the more thyroxine the thyroid releases, the faster our metabolic rate will be. However, it also inhibits the release of both TRH and TSH. So this dotted line here is supposed to show that inhibition. So all the while that thyroxine levels are high, no more TRH is released and no more TSH is released, and therefore that stops further thyroxine from being released. As the concentration of thyroxine drops, this inhibiting effect decreases, and the hypothalamus starts to release TRH, which tells the pituitary to release TSH, which tells the thyroid gland to start producing more thyroxine again. So you can see the way that high thyroxine prevents the release of further thyroxine by preventing the release of the TRH and the TSH. Now we call this type of system negative feedback. As a slight aside, some people do naturally release more thyroxine than others, and we might say they have an overactive thyroid. Um, and in that case, those people tend to be very, very slim. Uh, and the reason why is because they're very quickly burning through the energy stored in their food. So they're not storing much um, of that uh, excess energy in the form of fat. Equally, some people have underactive thyroids where they don't release enough uh, thyroxine and that makes it much easier for them to gain weight because they don't tend to burn through the energy in their food so quickly. So therefore, they store the excess as fat. The last thing we need to look at is the fight or flight response. This is also higher tier. So again, feel free to ignore if you're doing foundation tier. Now, the fight or flight response is about preparing the body for peak performance when we are in danger so that we can either fight or run away from that danger running running away is what we call the flight okay now this is uh, controlled by the hormone adrenaline and adrenaline is released by the adrenal glands those are those two glands that sit on top of the kidneys the target organs for adrenaline are the heart now when the heart um, is affected by adrenaline, it pumps faster and harder, which increases the heart rate and the blood pressure. Adrenaline also affects blood vessels and it increases blood flow to the muscles. 
And finally, the adrenaline affects the liver and it works in a similar kind of way to glucagon. It causes the liver to convert glycogen into glucose, which increases the blood glucose concentration. So the combined effect of all three things, of the heart pumping faster and harder, of the blood flow to the muscles increasing, and of the liver converting glycogen to glucose, is that it maximizes the amount of oxygen and glucose that reach our muscles to maximize the amount of energy they can release by respiration, which means they can be the strongest and fastest they can possibly be, which means we're most likely to be able to either fight our way out of danger or run away from that danger. Okay, so that's it, the end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.